I'll be honest, I didn't know what to expect when a developer I'd never heard of announced that they were making a horde shooter with the Aliens license. Compared to Terminator and Predator, I think the Aliens franchise is one that hasn't totally been ruined yet, despite Ridley Scott's best efforts. And I also think we've been pretty lucky with the games based off the series too, apart from a couple of questionable ones throughout the years. Pusty. Well, after having spent a fair bit of time with this thing over the last week or so, I have to say that I think Cold Iron Studios have done a pretty good job here with Aliens Fighting. It's not a perfect game, but it really is one of those instances where the license carries the whole thing along. Because I mean, realistically, if it didn't have that Aliens brand attached to it, it would be a fairly run-of-the-mill horde shooter. But playing as a colonial marine and lighting up Xenos with a pulse rifle and a smart gun ends up being pretty damn fun, just as long as you've got a couple of mates to play with. Yeah, let me just preface the video by saying that if you don't have at least one other person to play this with, well, you might want to consider spending your hard-earned dollary dues on something else. I know that this is a co-op shooter, so it's a bit redundant mentioning that, but it is still worth bringing up. In lieu of AI-controlled Marines, Fireteam gives you two combat synthetics in their place. I'm sorry, combat artificial persons. I prefer the term artificial person myself. And while these guys might be able to get you by on the default difficulty, they're about as useful as fart-flavored air freshener on the higher ones. In fact, the game outright tells you that it doesn't recommend playing with the bots on anything other than standard mode. Is there a problem? Anyway, sweethearts, you know the drill, assholes and elbows. Let's move like we've got a purpose and get into this thing. Now look, I'd be absolutely lying here if I said I knew what was going on with this story. There's all but a single cinematic in the entire campaign, and that's just a brief one you get when you first begin the game. After that, most dialogue is delivered via radio during a mission when you're usually way too distracted to pay attention, often accompanied by just some cringy dialogue that feels horribly out of place tonally. The whole thing's broken down into four acts, with three missions per act, which take roughly 20 to 30 minutes per mission. Then progressing to the next one's always done back at HQ, where you just kind of talk to characters that stand in one place the entire time. And I do think it's kind of lazy how they didn't even bother with the facial animation on these characters. God damn, you make me feel old. That makes the third Unreal Engine 4 game in a row that I've played that's done this, along with Chernobylite and Necromunda. It's kind of an odd omission considering otherwise it's a pretty damn good looking game. That is of course due a lot to the source material, and you're going to see some very familiar looking environments, locations, and enemies, most of which I don't want to spoil. It also ran really well for me, and I didn't have a single crash the entire time. About the only thing that it's lacking is an FOV slider, which is just suicide for developers to not include these in a game coming out in 2021. It's also, thankfully, not a game that desperately relies on fan service to make itself interesting. You know, like how in Colonial Marines, for instance, you'd come across something like Vasquez's smart gun? Well, it's got none of that. Hey, hey, remember Ghostbusters? Ooh, I, I mean, you'll see the power loader back at your base, but that's because it's exactly the kind of spot you'd expect to find one of those things. Yeah, it's fan service, but it's fan service that makes sense and doesn't come across as being obnoxious. They've also nailed the sound effects for all of the weapons. The beeping of the motion tracker and the hissing and screeching of the aliens, it's all in there. I mean, that iconic alien screech is like the series version of the Wilhelm scream. And it's got a decent soundtrack too. It doesn't outright lift entire tracks from the films, it just tries to replicate the same moods and motifs without coming across as being overbearing or distracting. I think the best kind of soundtracks are the ones that help to accentuate what's happening without detracting from it or feeling out of place. The worst thing you can get is loud heavy metal music when the gameplay doesn't match it, and that's not an issue here. Now this is a horde shooter, and you're going in there to destroy Xenos. Not to study, not to bring back, but to wipe out. Now they say that in space no one can hear you scream, unless of course you're wearing an Arctis Pro headset that is. I know, amazing, it's another one of my patented segues into thanking my sponsor, SteelSeries. Yes, yeah, son, still series make the best gaming keyboards, mice, pads, and headsets. And if you're going to be taking on Xenomorphs, you want to do it with the best gear possible. A lot of this stuff is also RGB with different color settings, so you can really set the atmosphere properly when you're playing. I played through this whole thing with a couple of mates, and using the Arctis Pro, I could adjust the sound of the game independently from the sound of the voice chat, making it a perfect balance. So if you want to get 12% off your next order, make sure you use that promo code GMAN at checkout. Once you get into the game, you've got to choose who you're going to play as, and initially you've got four classes to choose from, with one more class being unlocked when you finish the game for the first time. The two most basic classes are the Gunner and the Demolisher. Now, these are kind of like your DPS builds. 
Remember Drake and Vasquez from Aliens? Well, that's basically what this role is. When it comes to killing Xenos, these guys only need to know one thing, where they are. Let's rock! The gunner can carry a pulse rifle and a close quarters weapon like a shotgun, and the demolisher carries a pulse rifle, but more importantly, can rock the smart gun. And emptying one of these things down a corridor at a group of approaching Xenos is about as satisfying as this game ever gets. You can customize the armor and appearance of all of these classes individually, which is kind of cool. And let me just say, if you're not always wearing a bandana when playing as the Demolisher and carrying around that smart gun, well, I'm sorry to say, but you're playing the game incorrectly. On top of that stuff too, each class also has its own unique abilities. The gunner can throw out a grenade and use one of the most broken abilities in the game called Overclock, which increases the fire rate of everyone's weapons at once. And the Demolisher can fire rockets over his shoulders and send out a shockwave to knock Xenos on their ass. And all I could think of whenever I used this was Ruin's special ability from Black Ops 4. Yeah, that ability. Schwacked. After that, you've got the support class, the technician, and the medic, and the technician was the one that I spent the most amount of time with here. This guy can drop down a mini turret that has infinite ammo. And the only real weakness there is that it can get destroyed if it's attacked, but about all you're suffering from there is like a 10 or so second cooldown. You can even modify it to turn it into a flamethrower, but I found that the basic version's pretty effective and it's really useful for crowd control. The technician's other ability are these throwable coils that slow down the movement speed of whatever runs through it. Now that might not sound like much, but it becomes an absolute godsend during some of the standoffs where you're all literally backed into a goddamn corner. <laughs> Finally, you've got the medic. Now, this guy puts down a trauma station that heals players slowly over time. And he's also got a combat stim that gives everyone increased accuracy and weapon stability. The thing though is that the trauma station is kind of weird to use. To refill the trauma station, you pick up health kits, but obviously you can only pick up one health kit at a time, and one kit won't even come close to filling this thing up to its max. The station does seem to heal plays pretty quickly, but you will have to stand in its radius to get that effect, and it's like standing still in this game during heavy swarms is kind of like signing your own death sentence, and it just seems like it's far easier for someone to use their own med kit. I gotta be honest, I just didn't find this class all that good, and if I'm missing something here, look, by all means someone tell me, but it just doesn't seem like it's very well thought out. Someone at Cold Iron Studios made a call here, and it was a bad call. It was a bad call. These people are dead, Burke! Finally, once you finish the campaign for the first time, you'll unlock the Recon class, and this guy can drop down a little robot that spawns in extra ammo, along with a drone that highlights Xenos through walls. Now, I can see how the first one's going to be really useful, because you've got an infinite supply of ammo here that's always on cooldown. But the second one just kind of seems less useful, simply because you've always got a pretty good idea of where the Xenos are coming from anyway. Where are they coming from? The thing about all of this too is that it's not a game you can just hop from class to class, and you really need to pick one early on and just kind of stick with it, especially if you're going to try those high difficulty modes. After finishing a mission, you earn a bunch of XP towards the weapons you've used and the class you're playing as, along with your base play level as well. So it is going to be a bit grindy in that respect, and it encourages sticking with a class over time. You know, instead of dicking around with one of them for a couple of missions, then just swapping it out when you get sick of it. There's a perk system here too, where you can drag and drop these little nodes down to customize the class, decreasing cooldown time through abilities and other generic benefits like increased weapon damage but these are mostly unlocked by leveling up each class separately. So like I said, it kind of pays in the long run to stick with them. What Fireteam really nails though, I think is just the most basic aspect that it had to, and that's the feeling of shooting Xenos. It is a bug hunt after all, and if the basic loop of shooting these things didn't feel satisfying, well then that was gonna be a huge issue. Thankfully, this isn't something I think Fireteam has to worry about. Whenever you kill a Xeno, you get a big red X that pops up to let you know it's down for good, which is kind of helpful when you've got a dozen of these things in the room at once, so you don't waste needless ammo on a corpse. When you score a headshot, you also get this unique sound effect. Which again, aside from just being helpful, becomes really addictive and almost encourages you to focus on them. The fodder aliens run around on all fours, kind of similar to the alien from the third film, which I guess hints that maybe they incubated in animals, and hence they're a lot weaker. Thankfully, you're not just going to be shooting these guys over and over, and there's a few special variants thrown in there to mess with you. You've got the spitters, which almost kind of seems like a requirement for a horde shooter these days. 
which are enemies that hang back and spit acid at you. There's the bursters, which explode on death, sending acid in all directions, and let me tell you, it takes some serious self-control here to not shoot one of these things when they're right in front of you. Prowlers like to hide in corners on ceilings and walls, waiting for someone to run by before pouncing on them, which never fails to make me fill my trousers. Then you've got some even bigger and tougher variants. The drone is a Xeno that looks a lot like the one from the first film. In a bit of a nod to the movie too, this thing comes out of the vents and attacks for a bit before running away again. The other one is modeled to look a lot like the Xenos from the second film, and these are the Warriors. Who are the Warriors? Again, it's a big tough bastard that comes running up and can do some pretty hefty damage if it manages to get a hold of someone. You warriors are good. Both of these types always get some kind of announcement when they're around. You also hear thudding footsteps when they're close. So it always manages to shift your attention right away. <laughs> Lastly, as you get closer to the hive, you can expect to see crushers and praetorians, requiring a lot of teamwork to put them down effectively. I mean, the best way here would just be to take off and nuke the site from orbit, but tactics and strategy are gonna have to suffice here. And when you encounter these stronger Xenos is when you're really going to start to appreciate how the stamina system works. When I first started playing this, I didn't understand why sprinting didn't use up stamina, but dodge rolling did. But then I realized that the reason for that is because dodge rolling is the only way to avoid some of these attacks. And if you could just spam dodge roll infinitely, well, it'd make the whole thing pretty cheesy. The drones and warriors, for instance, seem really tough at first, but when you figure out how blatantly they telegraph their attacks, you're going to start to appreciate the simple skill of a well-timed dodge roll. Warriors kind of kneel for a split second before pouncing and grabbing you. And once you recognize that pattern, it becomes really rewarding to avoid one of these guys and come out on the other end unscathed. But even just the basic run-of-the-mill Xenos, like they have a pretty distinct animation before attacking, and I mean you're not supposed to be able to avoid every single one of them, but being able to evade attacks when it matters does make the whole thing feel a lot more skillful. I think probably the biggest disappointment though are the facehuggers. In pretty much every other Aliens game, getting attacked by one of these things is usually a game over man, game over. But here it's just a lame button prompt to get them off. Now I understand that having these things instantly kill someone would kind of be unfair, but it does remove the threat of them quite a bit, considering that they've always been shown to be nasty little fuckers. For some of the later missions you're also fighting combat sins, at which point it turns into a cover based shooter, and I don't think this stuff's very good either. You just kind of stay in cover behind something and trade shots with these enemies on the other side of a room, and I mean if nothing else it at least has done a pretty good job of trying to mix things up. There's tougher synths that have flamethrowers and even working Joes that run right up to you and flush you out of your hiding spot. But it's really just a generic third person shooter at that point, and it's kinda similar to what happened in Colonial Marines when you were fighting the Wayland Yutani Mercs. All I was thinking the whole time I was fighting those guys was just how much I wanted to go back to shooting aliens. Now when it comes to shooting things, Fire Team has all of the kind of guns you'd expect. You've got the pulse rifle, the smart gun, and the shotgun for close encounters. They've done a pretty good job at trying to add in other weapons like pistols, submachine guns, and rifles, but the question is, like, why would I bother using anything else other than that holy trifecta? It's like playing as a Jedi in a Star Wars game and using anything other than a lightsaber. I don't know what playing an Aliens game would be like without a pulse rifle, frankly, I don't want to know. And if the option is there, I'm going to take that iconic weaponry 9 times out of 10. I mean, the smart gun and the pulse rifle are some of the most awesome weapons in the history of science fiction. All of these weapons can have attachments added, like bigger magazines, sights and barrels, which improves things like the reload times, accuracy and fire rate. And you can either buy these through a little store, or find them in hidden caches in the mission. And about the only thing that I found disappointing here was that there's no grenade launcher attachment for the pulse rifle, considering that's one of the most memorable features that weapon had. But even all these new weapons, when you deck them out in attachments, they just feel kind of underwhelming. They're about as effective as harsh language. They're pathetic. It's pathetic. And I have to give praise to the shotgun in this thing too, man. This bad boy would do Hicks proud, and it's honestly one of the better boomsticks I've experienced in recent memory. For starters, it just does insane damage, but it's also got crazy range. You can often cap Xenos on the other side of the room, it's not even funny. I also had an attachment on this thing that increased the reload speed to the point that it just kind of rendered the other weapons obsolete. 
Now, I know that complaining about an overpowered shotgun seems like a weird complaint to make, but it just reinforces how pointless a lot of these other weapons are, and it just didn't really encourage me to try something different when the most basic weapons are the most effective. Fire Team has a few difficulties to pick from, with the standard mode being the game's version of normal, and the one up from that, intense, requiring this arbitrary combat rating. Yeah, apparently to play this you need a combat rating of around 500, which you're probably not going to have for your first playthrough. So, what I think most people are going to do here is choose the standard difficulty, and the only issue with that is that this difficulty is just way too easy. Bah! So what I think most people are going to do is just choose the standard mode, and the only issue with that is that this difficulty is just way too easy. I'd say that this is the story mode, only there's no story here to speak of. I played through the entire game here with the same two mates of mine, and the only time that we wiped was when the game seemed to bug out, no pun intended, during a mission when we couldn't board the dropship to escape the level. Other than that though, it's just far too forgiving. Like look how long it takes a Xeno to kill a single person, it's pathetic. It's pathetic. On standard mode, there's not even friendly fire. So you can just go in there and shoot gun ho like an absolute bastard with zero regard for your teammates. When someone is pinned down by a Xeno, you can just shoot that Xeno off them and somehow the massive acid burst that comes from killing the damn thing doesn't seem to damage them. One point, I even had a mate using the flamethrower, and he used it to get a Xeno off me, and I mean, realistically, I should have been burned to a cinder, but I didn't lose so much as a slither of health. Ah, it burned! Ah, 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 ah. Considering how much they played up friendly fire in the films, it's a bit of a shame that this isn't at least incorporated into the standard difficulty mode. I can understand not including friendly fire on easy mode, but no friendly fire on normal mode is kind of like insulting the player's intelligence. I still don't quite understand what the combat rating actually affects either. Just seems to be an arbitrary number based off your weapon attachments and perks that somehow improves your combat effectiveness. Playing on intense though really does feel like the best way to play the game here and it's a noticeable step up in challenge. For starters, friendly fire is on and you can seriously fuck someone up if you're not careful. Acid does a lot more damage too and the special Xenos are a lot tougher. The revive timer when someone is down goes from 90 seconds down to 30. And if you're not coordinating your abilities, well, you're in for a world of hurt. I mean, good luck taking on a Praetorian if you're all running around aimlessly with your dicks out. The problem is that the difficulties after that seem to be gatekeeped by your combat rating. It's not enough to just simply be good at the game at this point. Instead of extreme mode just increasing the damage that enemies do and limiting your resources, it also artificially gives them extra health points. So not only do they do more damage, but they take longer to kill as well. The biggest problem I think Fireteam has though is the mission variety or the lack thereof, and once you've played a couple of missions, things don't really differentiate all that much. Basically, each mission begins with you and your buddies dropped off at the start of the area. You move through it, killing a bunch of Xenos along the way, occasionally stopping at some kind of computer system or something where you have to hunker down. You pop down your turrets, your support items, and you watch those ammo counters go as you just do your best to survive. There's always an ammo box nearby as well, so the whole notion of short controlled bursts isn't even an issue. And as long as you're communicating with your buddies, these moments are simple enough to get through. After doing a couple of these, you then do it yet again for the final phase of the mission, which is the same, it only just spawns in a few more of the tougher Xenos. But still, you've always got an infinite amount of ammo there to restock on, and it doesn't really play out any differently. And it's just such a shame that there's so little variety to any of this. You can mix things up a bit with the challenge cards though. Now, this is a system at the beginning of a mission where each player can put forth a card that's either gonna have a positive or a negative effect on the mission itself. This is then chosen at random before the match begins, or if only one person plays a card, then that card's picked by default. Could be something as simple as removing the heads up display so you've got no health bar or crosshair, through to increasing the experience you gain in a mission by up to two or three times but that's still not gonna really change the flow of the mission itself. You might be able to increase the amount of tougher Xenos that spawn in so you get a bigger reward, but you're still gonna be doing the exact same things regardless. You're just really moving from combat area to combat area. Kill everything, then move on to the next designated combat spot. Remember that scene in Aliens when Ripley had to go in and save Newt? Like, you could have a mission like that, where you've got to go into the hive to rescue like a captured marine or something. How about a sequence where you gotta weld the door shut and other two players have to hold off the Xenos? Like, that would've been awesome too. Whatever you're gonna do, do it fast. Every mission is just a shootout followed by another shootout. So as a result, the climactic shootouts at the end of the mission aren't really even that climactic because you've already done it three times before you got to that point. 
Look, man, I hate to compare every Horde shooter to Left 4 Dead, but it's a good comparison to make because that game does so many things right. And you remember how at the end of each chapter in those games, you'd hop on like an escape chopper or something and see dozens of zombies coming after you. It reinforced the fact that you were barely holding on and highlighted how if you even took a few more precious seconds to escape, you could have easily been overwhelmed. Aside from maybe a couple of missions, I think each final shootout comes to an abrupt finish and you can all just casually walk into the exit area to complete the mission. And you just rarely feel like you're barely making it to a safe spot by the skin of your teeth. Another big way in which the game lacks tension is that all of the combat is scripted, so every time you replay the missions, you get attacked at the exact same moments. Now, I know that trying to incorporate a seamless RNG system is really tricky, and I'm not saying that every single game has to have this, but that is the downfall of scripted sequences versus randomly generated ones. Each replay just becomes more of a going through the numbers process and less of an unscripted, on the edge of your seat, pants shittingly terrifying experience. Fire Team's Endgame is just about replaying all of these missions over and over, so it's really just going to depend on how long you want to do this before it just starts to get a bit boring. There's a Horde mode as well where you all just try to hold out as long as possible until you're white, but honestly, this isn't really all that interesting. The final mission in Fire Team though is the real letdown, and I don't want to spoil it, but I'll just say that it does what you'd expect, but it does it in the worst way possible. To the point that the only conclusion I can come to is that they're planning to resolve it in an upcoming DLC. I know they've already announced that there's going to be season passes, so this is something I really hope they rectify in the future. But you know what? I also kind of feel like a lot of these downfalls are just due to the limitations of the developers. In the sense that they're doing the best they could with the resources they had. I mean, if it was a game developed by a massive studio that could just burn through money, well, maybe more ideas would have been carried across. I was able to get through the whole thing for the first time in about 6 hours, which was roughly 90 minutes per act. Give or take a bit here and there as we all buggered around with buying new gear in between missions. And then finishing it again on the intense difficulty mode probably took another 3 or 4 hours. Overall though, I've got to be honest, Fight Team was a lot more fun than I was expecting. I really went in to play this thing expecting the worst. I even had a bunch of dialogue from the films I was planning to spin to work into my review if I ended up not liking it. How do I get out of this chicken shit outfit? That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. It's pathetic. But it turns out that I really didn't need to. I get a lot of shit from you people for using that fun with friends argument as a defense for a game, but this is really one of those times where it is a lot more fun with friends. And when you combine that with one of the better sci-fi series out there, well, it all comes together to provide some pretty damn good entertainment. So grab a couple of mates, a pulse rifle and a smart gun, and stay frosty. Come <laughs> on.